This is an axolotl. These derpy creatures have become very popular in the pet and aquarium trade, and in recent years their popularity has boomed. Their unique look, variety of colors, and super power level healing ability all contribute to their popularity with aquarists and herp keepers alike. Most popular YouTubers in the fish or reptile hobby have at least one axolotl, which has helped fuel this unique creature's popularity, and now with the introduction of axolotls in Minecraft, interest has grown significantly. If you're familiar with my channel, then you know I already have several videos talking about axolotl care. Many people have told me that my video, Five Things Axolotls Need, is the most complete care guide that they've seen, which is concerning because it's not a complete care guide. And until now, I haven't had a complete care guide for axolotls on my channel. So I'm changing that today. This video will be organized into several categories with timestamps in the description. Those categories are introduction and history, morphs, tank, filtration, water chemistry, temperature, nitrogen cycle, substrate, lighting, plants and hides, tank maintenance, tank mates, diet, procurement, quarantine, common illnesses and treatments, behavior, breeding, and metamorphosis. If you're looking for a specific topic, check the timestamps. And without any further ado, let's jump right into it. Axolotls, scientifically known as A. mexicanum, are fully aquatic salamanders that come from Lake Xochimilco in Mexico. They don't spawn in underground caves like they do in Minecraft. They have been nicknamed water dogs and Mexican walking fish, although they are neither dogs nor fish. They're amphibians. Pronunciation of their name varies regionally. In Spanish, the native language of their homeland, they are called ajolote. In some other countries, they are called asholat. However, in most English-speaking countries like the U.S. where I live, they are called axolotl. So that is how I will be referring to them throughout this video. Axolotls were first scientifically described in 1864 when a shipment was sent to Paris, with Aquarius being the first to show interest in keeping them. However, the scientific community very quickly became interested in axolotls, leading to a century and a half so far of medical and scientific studies involving axolotls. Currently, axolotls are a mainstay in laboratories that research things such as stem cells, regeneration, cancer, and organ grafting. This is because axolotls have the unique ability to regenerate and regrow practically anything like Wolverine from the X-Men or Claire Bennett from Heroes if you happen to remember that show. Unlike other salamanders, axolotls stay in their larval form their entire life, never metamorphosizing into terrestrial salamanders. Basically, they are forever tadpoles. They are fully aquatic and will spend 100% of their life in the water. Some axolotls may metamorphosize into terrestrial salamanders, but this is extremely rare and it should be avoided. I'll talk more about metamorphosis later in this video. Because axolotls are salamander larvae, it is very common for people to mistake other types of salamander larvae for axolotls. I get messages and comments from people all the time saying they found axolotls in the stream behind their house or in a lake, when in fact what they found is a larval salamander or newt of another species. It's almost impossible to tell the difference between 
an axolotl and the larval form of a tiger salamander, for example. So if you found an axolotl in the wild anywhere other than Lake Xochimilco, no, you didn't. Although axolotls are thriving in both laboratories and the pet trade, they are listed as critically endangered in the wild as of 2008. This is primarily due to habitat loss. They are native to a single lake in Mexico called Lake Xochimilco. Originally, Lake Xochimilco was part of a series of five interconnected lakes in the Valley of Mexico, including Lake Chaco, Lake Haltican, Lake Zampango, and Lake Texcoco. Over the years, these lakes have mostly disappeared. They were drained to reduce flooding as Mexico City and the surrounding area was developed for human settlement. All that remains now is a series of canals where Lake Xochimilco used to be located. The other four lakes sadly no longer exist. The canals of Lake Xochimilco is the only remaining native habitat for wild axolotls, and this area was declared a biological reserve by the Mexican government in 1984. Conservationists are working with wild axolotls, trying to sustain their population, but this has proven challenging in the polluted ruins of Lake Xochimilco. The closest relative to the axolotl is the tiger salamander, and in fact the golden albino morph axolotl was first created by crossbreeding tiger salamanders and axolotls together. This permanently changed axolotl genetics as this morph was integrated into captive axolotl populations where it then further bred. Today, it is likely that most, if not all, captive axolotls contain tiger salamander DNA, which means pet or laboratory axolotls cannot be released back into Lake Xochimilco as they are genetically different from wild axolotls. In the home aquarium, a well-kept axolotl will live for 12 to 15 years. They grow to a maximum length of between 9 and 18 inches long, or between 22 and 45 centimeters. Unlike their Minecraft counterparts who attack fish and squids on site, axolotls are not generally aggressive. Instead, they are opportunistic hunters who spend most of their time hiding in shady areas, waiting for something tasty to swim by. You can tell if an axolotl is male or female by looking at the cloaca at the base of their tail. A male's cloaca will appear swollen, while the females only have a tiny bump if they even have a bump at all. Females also tend to have rounder bellies, while males are skinnier with longer bodies. Axolotls come in a variety of colors known as morphs. This is something that mostly occurs with captive axolotls as wild axolotls tend to be dark in color so they can avoid predators. However, being in captivity has allowed for more color variations to survive and breed. Popular morphs include the wild type, melanoid, albino, leucistic, golden albino, and copper. Speckled axolotls are a leucistic variation with dark brown, black, or green speckles on their face and their head. A less common morph is the lavender or dalmatian morph, which has a lighter, almost silver or purple color with gray spots. There is also a gene called GFP, which is present in several different morphs. GFP stands for green fluorescent protein, and it causes axolotls with that gene to glow green when exposed to UV light or black light. Green fluorescent protein is originally found in jellyfish, and it was first introduced into the axolotl genome artificially by researchers at the Max Planck Institute in 2005 to study cellular movement and cancer. Descendants of axolotls with this protein will also carry the protein, regardless of their morph. The Chimera axolotl is a rarity that some people don't even consider a morph. Chimeras are split down the middle, showing one morph on one side of their body and another morph on the other side. This occurs when two eggs fuse together into one. This is not a genetic trait and it cannot be selectively bred. It is a developmental anomaly that happens totally on accident. 
Similarly, the mosaic morph is also the result of two eggs fusing together during development. Each mosaic is unique, this again cannot be selectively bred, and it is extremely rare. Piebald axolotls are white leucistic axolotls with black eyes and dark patches on their head and on their body. This is a rare gene that causes localized concentrations of melanin. This gene can be inherited, though it is very rare, and most breeders who produce piebald axolotls are located in New Zealand. And then there's a controversial type of axolotl called the firefly axolotl. This is an artificial morph, and only two breeders in the US are known to produce them. One of these breeders refers to them as fireflies, while the other refers to them as lightning bugs, but they are the same thing. Firefly axolotls are created in a laboratory by swapping the tails of two axolotls while they are still an embryo in the egg. The two axolotls whose tails are swapped are of different morphs, a wild type and a GFP albino. This creates two axolotls, one who has a dark body and a light tail that glows under UV or black light, like a firefly, and another with a light body that glows under UV or black light and a dark tail. As the tails are swapped while they are embryos, they have not yet developed nerve endings, so they do not feel pain from the procedure. The breeders who produce these axolotls report 100% success rates. However, due to the nature of how they are produced, the ethics of this procedure has been questioned. This procedure was originally developed as an experiment into organ grafting, but high success rates have turned it into an obtainable, yet still highly expensive, morph for the pet trade. The requirements for keeping an axolotl at home can sound very intimidating. There is a lot of information to learn and remember, but once you learn the basics, actually keeping the axolotl isn't so difficult. And this all starts with the tank. The general consensus among most axolotl keepers is that a single adult axolotl needs a tank that is at least a minimum of two feet long. That would be a standard 20 gallon US or 75 liter tank. However, as axolotls spend most of their time exploring the floor of the tank, it's generally recommended to get a 20 gallon long as opposed to a standard 20 gallon, as a 20 gallon long provides more floor space. That said, if you have the ability to get a larger tank, you probably should. Axolotls are messy creatures that produce a lot of waste, and even with a filter, which we will get to shortly, they can dirty their water very quickly. If you have a 20 gallon tank, you will have to do more water changes and more tank maintenance than if you have a larger tank. Axolotls will also utilize the additional space if you provide them with a larger tank, and if you plan on keeping multiple axolotls, you're going to need a larger tank anyway. I currently have two axolotls and I keep them together in a 60 gallon tank. Some people may consider that to be excessive and technically I do have room for more axolotls in that tank, but I found more success in lightly stocking my tanks. I used to only have one axolotl and I kept her in a 20 gallon long tank. This worked, but I had to do two large water changes every week just to keep up with the waste. After upgrading to the 60 gallon tank, my workload significantly reduced. Even after adding the second axolotl to the tank, I only have to do water changes once every two weeks to keep the water parameters in check. For a single adult axolotl, I recommend a 40 gallon breeder or 150 liter tank as the ideal size. Although a 20 gallon long is the industry standard minimum, I recommend going above the minimum as the axolotl will utilize the extra space and it will make your life easier as the keeper. If you have more axolotls or you just want to spoil your axolotl, you can even go bigger. 
but I will never shame someone for just meeting that minimum and using a 20 gallon tank for a single X lotl. But do keep in mind that that is the minimum and we as pet keepers should aim higher than to simply provide the minimum for our pets. Juvenile axolotls don't really need as much room as adults, but depending on their size, they may still utilize the extra space anyway if you give it to them. If you are a breeder or you're raising axolotls from eggs, then you will need significantly smaller tanks or maybe even tubs so that you can monitor the axolotls development. We'll cover that later in the video when we discuss breeding. However, that will not apply to most pet keepers as axolotls are already several inches long when they're sold as pets. The recommended minimum tank size for a single juvenile pet axolotl is 10 gallons US or a 37 liter tank. But keep in mind your axolotl will grow very fast and they will outgrow that 10 gallon tank in less than a year. I recommend just skipping the juvenile tank altogether and setting up your axolotl's permanent tank instead that they're going to use when they become an adult. This way you can avoid needing to size up the tank and this will also reduce your cost because you will only need to buy one tank instead of buying a tank now and buying another tank in a few months. You don't need to worry about any negative effects on the axolotl from putting them in an adult sized tank when they're a juvenile. They're not going to become stressed from their tank being too big and as long as you're tong feeding them or you're dropping their food right in front of their face, they're not going to have trouble finding their food because the tank's too big. Whatever tank you get though, make sure that you get a lid. Axolotls do jump and they will jump out of the tank if there is not a lid. I've seen my own axolotls jump and hit the lid several times, which makes me thankful that I have a lid. Without a lid, they could jump out of the tank and as they are fully aquatic, if no one is around to put them back in when that happens, that could be a tragedy. As I mentioned earlier, axolotls are messy creatures and they create a lot of waste. They have large, frequent poops and they will dirty the water very quickly. So just like any other aquatic creature, their water needs to be filtered. Luckily, there are a variety of filtration methods that are appropriate for axolotls, including sponge filters, hang on back filters, and canister filters. One thing to keep in mind is that axolotls can be sensitive to heavy currents. So whatever filtration method you use should provide a gentle current as opposed to a strong one. For smaller tanks like a 20 gallon, sponge filters are often recommended. They run off of an air pump and can provide a very gentle current, which you can adjust with a valve connected to the plastic air tubing. However, chain pet stores tend to not carry sponge filters in store but you can easily buy them online from Amazon or Aquarium Co-op or another online seller. If there is a local fish store in your area, they probably sell sponge filters as well. But the downside to using sponge filters is that they become very dirty very quickly in axolotl tanks and they do have to be cleaned monthly. When cleaning a sponge filter, make sure you use old tank water or otherwise dechlorinated water. Don't just use straight tap water to clean your filter because tap water contains chlorine and this can kill the beneficial bacteria that lives on the filter and potentially crash your tank cycle. Sponge filters are also not as effective at cleaning the water as other filtration methods. So if you use a sponge filter, you'll probably have to do more spot cleaning and more water changes than if you use another type of filter. Another option is a hang on back filter or HOB for short. This is the most common type of filter for aquariums and you can buy one anywhere that sells aquarium supplies, including chain pet stores. HOB filters are more powerful than sponge filters, which can be both good and bad. They are more effective at cleaning waste from the water, but they can cause a more powerful current, which can be stressful on your axolotl. 
Some companies, such as AquaClear, make hang-on-back filters that have a flow adjustment on them, so you can reduce the strength of the current. But those are more expensive, and I've found that sometimes the current is still too strong even with the flow turned all the way down. But modifications can be made to HOB filters to further reduce the current. This involves attaching a sponge to the output and the input of the filter. This is effective at reducing the current, but it causes the filter to work harder, reducing its lifespan. This also creates more things that you have to clean when you do tank maintenance, as the sponges will become clogged with muck over time. Just like with sponge filters, your HOB filter will need to be cleaned regularly with old tank water or dechlorinated water. Also, most HOB filters have a carbon cartridge that should be replaced every month. You can replace the carbon cartridge with reusable filter media, but that media you replace it with will need to be cleaned regularly as well. I have a video showing how to replace your carbon cartridge with reusable media, and I will link that video in the iCard above, as well as in the video description. And my favorite filter option for axolotls is canister filters. A canister filter sits outside the tank, and it has hoses that go into the tank, one for the input and one for the output. Although this is the most expensive option, it's also the option that allows you the most customization and the most control. The output hose can be attached to a spray bar, which will more widely distribute the water output and reduce the flow. I have attached multiple spray bars to my canister filter to create an even calmer flow. The filter media is located inside the external canister and it can be cleaned or changed without needing to drain the tank. You can also attach canister filters to other components, such as an aquarium chiller. Canister filters are available for any size tank that is appropriate for an adult axolotl. For anyone with an aquarium, I strongly recommend getting a water testing kit. API makes a freshwater master test kit that is perfect for testing the water parameters of an axolotl tank. This will include tests for pH, ammonia, nitrite, and nitrate. Get the kit that comes with vials and liquids, not the paper strips because those aren't as precise. You should also get a separate kit to test your water hardness. Alternatively, your local fish store or your chain pet store should offer free water testing. You can bring them a water sample from your aquarium and they can test for whatever measurement you're looking for. It is essential for the well-being of your axolotl that you know what your water chemistry is like and that you know how to measure your water parameters. Your water is not fine or perfect or ready. Those are not measurements. If your axolotl does have any health issues, water chemistry may be a factor and knowing how to measure your water parameters will be essential. Measuring your water parameters will also be vital for cycling your aquarium, which I will cover later in this video. Most tap water, particularly city water, contains trace amounts of chlorine and chloramine, both of which are toxic to axolotls. So it is recommended to treat your water with a water conditioner or dechlorinator to remove those chemicals when filling the tank and when doing water changes. I recommend Seachem Prime Water Conditioner, hashtag not sponsored, as it not only removes chlorine and chloramine, but it also temporarily neutralizes ammonia. If you get your water from a well, then it may not contain these chemicals, but you should test your water with your water testing kit just to be sure. Axolotls are hardy creatures, and they can do well in a range of environments. Any pH between 6.5 and 8.0 is acceptable, but they have an ideal pH between 7.4 and 7.6. If your pH is outside of that ideal range, but still within the acceptable range, that's okay. For axolotls, a stable pH is way more important than reaching the ideal pH. If you're using products or chemicals to alter your water's pH level, 
that can cause frequent fluctuations in the water parameters. And that's way more detrimental than just not having the ideal pH. As long as your water falls within the acceptable range, your axolotl should still live a long and healthy life. But water that does hit that ideal pH level will help them reach their maximum lifespan. But what's more important than pH is the water hardness and dissolved solids. Water hardness is a term used to describe dissolved salts and minerals in the water. When water reaches a certain level of total dissolved solids or TDS, we stop referring to it as hardness and we start referring to it as salinity, which is how brackish water and salt water is measured. In short, TDS and salinity is a scale that goes from soft water to hard water on the freshwater side and then to brackish water, and then to salt water. Axolotls do live in fresh water, not brackish or salt water. However, they do need hard water as opposed to soft water. If the water is too soft, axolotls may experience anemia, which will cause pale pigmentation and gill discoloration. There isn't an official answer on the ideal TDS or water hardness level for an axolotl, as long as your water falls within the range that is considered to be hard water, which is a TDS reading between 250 and 420 parts per million, then you're good to go. If your water is too soft, you can harden it by adding chemical products sold at pet stores, but keep in mind that sudden changes in water chemistry may be detrimental to your axolotl, so water changes should occur gradually if you're doing this. In some cases, if your tap water is too soft, it may be best to just not get an axolotl. Although axolotls come from Mexico, do not be fooled into thinking they're a tropical species. They are, in fact, a cold water species, and they do best in cooler waters between 60 and 64 degrees Fahrenheit, or between 16 and 18 degrees Celsius. They can survive in warmer temperatures for a short while, but you should aim to keep their tank within that ideal range. Temperatures above 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius are not okay. You should also avoid temperatures below 55 degrees Fahrenheit or 12.7 degrees Celsius. So don't keep your axolotl in the refrigerator. Depending on the temperature of your home, you may or may not need to incorporate a cooling method into your axolotl tank. You should set up your tank several weeks before getting your axolotl anyway so the tank can properly cycle, so use this time to determine whether or not you need to cool the tank and to incorporate a cooling method if you need to. There are several cooling methods that you can use, and you may find success in combining some of these methods together. The first and most effective method is also the most expensive, and that is to use an aquarium chiller. Most pet stores do not carry aquarium chillers, but you can buy an aquarium chiller online. They do, however, cost several hundreds of dollars. They are external units, similar to canister filters, and they usually require a pump of some sort to push the water from the tank into the chiller. Depending on the type of chiller you get, you may be able to connect your chiller to a canister filter, which is what I have done. I ran a hose from the output of my canister filter to the input of my chiller, so the water goes from the tank to the canister filter, then from the canister filter to the chiller, then from the chiller back into the tank through the spray bar. If you don't have a canister filter, you can still use an aquarium chiller. You'll probably just need to connect a pump to it to move the water instead, as most aquarium chillers don't have an internal pump. Aquarium chillers have adjustable temperature controls, and they keep the water at a very consistent temperature at all times. If you can't afford an aquarium chiller, or you simply just don't want to spend that much money, there are other alternatives. The first being height. Heat rises, so naturally, if you keep your aquarium at a lower elevation, it will naturally be colder. If you have a basement, that might be a good place to keep your axolotl tank. Or if you have a shelf or rack system, 
keeping your axolotl tank on the lowest shelf will help keep the tank cooler than if you keep it on a higher shelf or on an aquarium stand. You can also use a wire or mesh lid, which will create more air exchange and help cool the water. As I mentioned earlier, axolotls do need a lid on their tank so they don't jump out, but using a mesh or a wire lid may help cool the tank. You can also get an aquarium fan. You would have to buy this online as they're not generally sold in stores, but these fans are effective, especially when combined with a mesh or wire lid. Using an aquarium fan will cause the water to evaporate faster, which will cool the water. This is called evaporative cooling. I was successful with keeping my previous 20 gallon axolotl tank at the ideal temperature by combining an aquarium fan with a mesh lid and keeping the tank on a low shelf. Another common cooling method is to freeze water bottles and to float them in the aquarium until they thaw. Depending on how hot the area you live is though, this may or may not be a feasible solution. I don't recommend this for a long-term solution as you will have to replace and refreeze the water bottles several times a day. Personally, I tried this when I first set up my very first axolotl tank and I was experimenting with different cooling methods and I did not find it to be an effective method for my situation. But your situation may be different and you may have different results. I've talked about water chemistry and I've talked about temperature, but the nitrogen cycle is probably the most important item when discussing water parameters. You may have heard people talk about cycling a tank. You may have been told you need to cycle your tank before you put an axolotl in it. But what does that mean? In short, before you add the axolotl to the tank, you need to make sure that the tank is capable of processing the waste your axolotl is going to create. Cycling a tank takes time, several weeks in fact. Tanks do not cycle by running overnight. If someone told you to run the tank for 24 hours or 48 hours so that the tank can establish, that person did not give you accurate information. If you set up a tank yesterday, you should not be putting an axolotl in that tank today. If you have not yet set up your tank, do not buy an axolotl yet. Do not buy an axolotl and a tank in the same shopping trip. Aquariums take time, and if you try to rush it, you will kill your axolotl. Like any other animal, axolotls poop, and when their poop breaks down naturally in the aquarium, it releases ammonia into the water. Ammonia is also produced from axolotls breathing through their gills. Decaying organic matter such as uneaten food or decaying plant matter also produces ammonia. Ammonia is toxic and it will kill your axolotl if it builds up in the tank, so it needs to be removed from the water. Your filter does not remove ammonia from the water. It removes waste and debris from the tank. Water passes through the filter, and in doing so, it passes through filter media that catches all the waste and debris. Ammonia is a liquid, and it will pass right through the filter. The nitrogen cycle works as follows. Your axolotl creates waste, and that waste creates ammonia in the water, which is toxic to your axolotl. There is a certain type of bacteria that occurs in aquariums that eats that liquid ammonia. That bacteria, however, also creates waste, and that liquid waste is called nitrite. Like ammonia, nitrite is also toxic to your axolotl. Luckily, there is another type of bacteria that occurs naturally in aquariums that eats that liquid nitrite. However, it also produces a liquid waste, and that waste is called nitrate. Nitrate is also toxic, but it's way less toxic than ammonia or nitrite. Small amounts of nitrate are safe in an aquarium, but over time nitrates build up and need to be removed from the water. This is why we do water changes, to remove those nitrates. 
Plants also consume nitrates naturally, so if you have live plants in your tank, you will probably have to do water changes less frequently. This colony of beneficial bacteria will live all over in your tank on all of the hard surfaces such as the substrate and the aquarium glass and the caves and the plants and the decor. However, the largest concentration of this beneficial bacteria will live in your aquarium filter on the media where all of the debris that is getting filtered out will be caught. This bacteria is produced naturally when ammonia is introduced into the tank However, this is a slow process, but you can boost this process by using a bottled bacteria product sold at pet stores such as Quick Start. Be aware that using a product like Quick Start does not instantly cycle your tank. It just introduces starter bacteria spores into the tank. That bacteria will still need time to establish a stable colony and it will need an ammonia source to do so. So you will need to feed that bacteria to cycle your tank. And there are several ways to feed ammonia to this bacteria colony. You can use a bottled ammonia product such as Dr. Tim's ammonium chloride solution for aquariums, or you can just put fish food in the tank and let it break down and decay naturally. You can also do what's known as a fish in cycle, which is where you keep a fish in the tank while it's cycling and that fish and the waste that it produces will be the ammonia source. However, this method is widely considered to be inhumane because it can be detrimental to the health of that fish, so I do not recommend it. However you decide to do it, you use your water testing kit to test the ammonia, nitrite, and nitrate levels while your tank is cycling. There is no set amount of time for how long it takes a tank to cycle, and every tank is different. It may take several weeks. Your tank is cycled when you can add ammonia to the tank, and then 24 hours later, you get an ammonia reading of zero, and a nitrite reading of zero, and a nitrate reading above zero. Do a large water change when your aquarium is finished cycling, and then you can introduce your axolotl. When adding your axolotl to the tank, don't just release it or dump it into the tank. Instead, you're going to need to acclimate the axolotl. If you don't acclimate your axolotl, you could send it into shock. Your axolotl should come in a bag that has water in it already. So you just take that bag and you float it in the top of the tank for 15 to 30 minutes until the water inside of the bag matches the temperature of the tank. Once this is done, you can remove the axolotl from the bag and then gently add them to the tank. Do not just dump the bag water into the tank because that bag water is going to have a very high ammonia level. If your tank is not fully cycled before introducing the axolotl, it may experience some moderate to severe side effects that could be detrimental to its health. If you do introduce the axolotl before the tank finishes cycling, you will need to do large water changes every day or possibly twice a day until the nitrogen cycle has completed. These frequent water changes will cause the tank to take longer to cycle, but the health of your axolotl should take priority over that. Unlike most fish who spend all their time swimming, axolotls spend most of their time on the floor of the tank, walking or resting on the substrate. They do swim, but the majority of the time they are on the floor. Unlike fish, axolotls don't have scales. Their skin is more sensitive than the skin of a fish, and rough gravel can cut or irritate their belly as they walk across the substrate. Due to the way axolotls eat, they are also at risk of impaction, which means they can ingest something that they cannot digest or pass, such as gravel. When food is in front of an axolotl, they open their mouth and just vacuum suck whatever is in front of them into their mouth, whether that be fish or a worm or their substrate. 
it's very common for axolotls to ingest substrate when they eat. And because of this, some substrate is not considered safe for axolotls because it will get stuck inside them, causing blockages, bloating, and constipation that can lead to serious health problems, including death. Substrates that are considered unsafe or otherwise bad are as follows. Gravel. Just your standard aquarium gravel that you can get from the pet store is a high-risk substrate for axolotls. It is small enough to be ingested, so they will ingest it, and your axolotl will be unable to digest or pass it. Also, as I mentioned before, gravel can be rough and it may cut or irritate their belly skin. Rocks and pebbles that can fit inside of an axolotl's mouth are also bad. Even if it's smooth and it won't irritate their belly, there's still a possibility that the axolotl can ingest rocks when they eat. So the only way to prevent this is to ensure that any rocks that are in the axolotl's tank are larger than the axolotl's head so that they can't fit inside of their mouth. Glass stones or beads that are sold in pet stores and arts and crafts stores should also be avoided for the same reason as rocks and pebbles, as they are small enough to be ingested and will absolutely cause impaction. If your axolotl is a baby or a juvenile, you should also avoid using sand until they get bigger. Axolotls cannot digest sand, however, when they're larger, they can pass sand through their digestive system safely. Younger axolotls, however, cannot pass sand through their digestive system because their system is still developing. So you should avoid using sand for any axolotl that is smaller than 5 inches or 13 centimeters long. Regardless of your axolotl size, though, you should avoid using dyed sand as the dye can leach into the water, making it cloudy, and depending on the dye, it may even be toxic to your axolotl. So now that we've covered some bad substrate options, let's talk about some good ones, starting with no substrate, also known as a bare bottom tank. If you have a bare bottom tank, then there is zero risk of impaction. It's also super easy to clean, and you can just see when your axolotl has pooped or has left uneaten food in the tank. But this can also be annoying because seeing waste in the tank can be aesthetically unpleasant. Using a substrate will make waste less noticeable, so if seeing waste in the tank bothers you, going bare bottom might not be the right choice for you. Bare bottom tanks also offer no leverage or grip for the axolotl. Instead, the floor is just slippery glass, and this might be stressful for some axolotls. If your axolotl is an adult, or at least longer than 5 inches, then you can safely use sand without risking impaction. Sand definitely offers more grip than the slippery glass of a bare bottom tank, and it is much more aesthetically pleasing. It also offers more surface area for beneficial bacteria to colonize, which helps keep your water parameters stable. Some aquatic plants can also live in sand, which can help keep your nitrates down. But not all aquatic plants do well in sand because it can compress the roots of a plant, so be mindful of that when you're selecting plants. If you use sand, do not make the sand bed too deep. If the sand is more than an inch or two deep, gas and air pockets can occur in the sand, and when sand gets stirred up, those gases are released into the water and that can cause the water to become toxic. Make sure that you stir the sand bed regularly to prevent air pockets and the buildup of gases. Sand is also difficult to clean, so if you use a gravel vac, you will probably suck up a lot of sand when doing water changes. Another great substrate option to use is tile or slate. Not all kinds of tile are appropriate, such as vinyl or laminate, but stone tile and slate is a great option. Some types of tile are more slippery and some are more rough, so if you go this route, make sure that you get a tile that offers your axolotl some grip. You can also use silicone or grout with the tile or slate, just make sure that it's an aquarium safe silicone or grout. 
You can also just pour a thin layer of sand over the tile or the slate, and you can move that around and use that to fill in the gaps between the tiles instead of using grout. This is easily the best looking option, and if you look in the kitchen backsplash aisle of the hardware store, you can find some pretty cool tile designs. Tile and slate cannot be ingested by your axolotl, so this is also one of the safer options. And the final substrate option that I want to discuss is large rocks, meaning rocks that are larger than the axolotl's head. Ideally, rocks that are larger than the axolotl's body. This works best when mixed with another substrate such as sand. Large rocks can also offer footing in a bare bottom tank so that your axolotl will have something to grip onto. Large rocks can be expensive, however, so keep that in mind. And if you source rocks from outside, you'll need to make sure that they've been thoroughly sanitized and are free of any pests before you put them into your aquarium. Axolotls don't have eyelids, so they cannot blink or close their eyes, which makes them sensitive to light. They need to have either low light or places in the tank where they can escape from the light. If you have a planted tank, that's okay. You're not going to kill your axolotl by having a light for your plants, but if the axolotl has no way of escaping that light, they will become irritated and stressed, and over time, the light might damage their eyes. If you don't have plants, then a dim light is preferred. It's also perfectly fine to just not put a light on the tank at all, and to instead use the ambient light from the room to observe your axolotl. I understand most people will want a light on their tank, however, so they can see their axolotl more clearly, and that's okay, as long as the axolotl has shelter from the light when they need it. Plants and hides provide shelter from light and also provide enrichment for your axolotl. This is a lot more than just simply being aquarium decor. This is an essential item for axolotls. I found that my axolotls prefer to spend a lot of their time in their caves and hidden underneath the leaves of plants. Fake plants are perfectly fine, but live plants are also safe for axolotls. Floating plants like Water lettuce will help reduce the amount of light that reaches the tank floor. Axolotls like dense coverage, but also appreciate open areas where they can swim freely, so make sure you provide them with both. Most fish caves that you can buy at the pet store will be too small for an adult axolotl. However, if you just go one aisle over and look in the reptile section, you will find reptile hides that will work just fine. And a less expensive cave option is to use PVC pipes from the hardware store. Depending on the size of your tank and what kind of filter you have and whether or not you have live plants and how many axolotls you have, your maintenance schedule will vary. Most aquarists recommend a blanket routine of doing at least a 50% water change every week, during which time you clean the walls of the tank with an algae scraper and also clean the substrate with a gravel vac and cleaning your filter every 30 to 90 days. But if you become familiar with your water parameters, you can work out a routine that works best for your tank. Test your water's nitrate level regularly. You'll need to keep your nitrate level at or below 50 parts per million, so you may need to do water changes more often or less often than what is generally recommended based on your nitrate levels. 
If you're using an evaporative cooling method, such as an aquarium fan, then you may need to do water changes more frequently just to keep your water level up. If you have a sponge filter and a 20 gallon tank, you may need to do water changes twice a week just to clean out all of the waste that your filter is leaving behind. If you have a large, understocked aquarium and a canister filter like I do, you may only need to do water changes every other week. Axolotl poops can be big and noticeable, so it's a good idea to have a turkey baster on hand that you can use for spot cleaning. Make sure the turkey baster has never been used for food and make sure you only clean it with water, never any chemicals or soaps. People often ask, what kind of tank mates can I keep with my axolotl? And honestly, the only real answer here is more axolotls. Axolotls and fish don't typically mix well in the home aquarium, and if you are a beginner axolotl keeper or aquarist, I strongly advise against trying to keep anything other than axolotls with axolotls. There are two reasons for this. First, axolotls will eat anything that can fit in their mouth, whether that is a fish or a shrimp or even another smaller axolotl. Sometimes juvenile axolotls may even nip at each other and try to eat each other's limbs, so it's generally recommended to only keep adult axolotls of the same sex together. And second, some fish will nip at the axolotl's gills because they look like little worms. This will injure the axolotl's vital breathing organs, and though the gills will grow back, they'll have trouble breathing until they do. I sometimes get asked, can I keep a male and female axolotl together? And the answer to that is no, unless you are keeping them together specifically to breed them, and even then, that should only be temporary and you should separate them after they breed. If you keep males and females together long term, the males will constantly breed with the females, which will stress the female's body. Axolotls lay hundreds of eggs with each clutch, and that takes a lot out of the female physically. And most breeders recommend that a female only breed once a year because of this. Keeping a male and a female together long term and just letting them freely breed is irresponsible, and it puts your axolotl's health at risk. I also regularly get asked specifically about keeping goldfish and white cloud mountain minnows as tank mates with axolotls. Goldfish, though they have the same water parameter requirements, are a bad fit because they will nip at the axolotl, particularly at the axolotl's gills. And white cloud mountain minnows will nip at the axolotl a little bit less, but they will more than likely become food and there are more appropriate food options available for axolotls than minnows and goldfish. In the wild, axolotls eat a variety of things, from bugs to fish to worms. However, in captivity, axolotl keepers have found that axolotls are the healthiest when they're primarily fed a diet of worms. Adult axolotls should be fed live night crawlers or other large earthworms as a staple diet. Night crawlers can be quite large though, and sometimes they need to be cut in half in order for your axolotl to be able to eat it. Other appropriate worms for axolotls are red wigglers, although they have more of a bitter flavor that some axolotls don't like, and live blackworms, which are smaller and a little harder to procure. You should never feed an axolotl a worm with an exoskeleton, such as a mealworm or a superworm, because they will have trouble digesting those. Bloodworms should generally be avoided or only given as a treat as they lack nutritional value and are the worm equivalent of junk food. Juvenile axolotls may be too small to eat earthworms, even if they're cut in half, 
because they might be too thick, but they should be able to eat red wigglers as they are thinner and live black worms. Some pellet foods can also be fed to both adult and juvenile axolotls, such as Hikari sinking carnivore pellets. If you do feed a pellet food though, make sure it's a high quality pellet that is made specifically for carnivores and is high in protein. Babies and hatchlings, however, will be too small to even eat blackworms and they will not readily eat pellet food. So you'll need to make sure that you have a source of live micro foods available for them, such as baby brine shrimp or daphnia. Adult axolotls should only be fed three to four times a week. Juveniles should be fed daily and babies should have access to food at all times. One question that comes up a lot is, where can I get an axolotl? The answer depends on where you're located. Keep in mind, axolotls are illegal to keep in some places, including some US states, such as California, Maine, New Jersey, and Virginia. In New Mexico, they are legal to own, but they're illegal to import from other states, so you have to source them locally. Check your local exotic pet laws to verify that you can keep one. As axolotls are native to Mexico and are considered critically endangered, they should never be taken from the wild. So if you are in Mexico and you want to own an axolotl, get your axolotl from a reputable breeder, not from the wild. Axolotls are very common in the US pet trade and aren't very hard to find if you live in the US. They are present at most reptile expos and aquarium shows. Some pet shops even sell them, but typically not the chain pet stores. And you can always get them online. If you want an axolotl and you have an internet connection, you can buy one right now and have it delivered to your doorstep tomorrow. Axolotls range in price depending on the morph and the age and the history of the animal. You can generally get a wild type for between 30 and 50 US dollars, and the various morphs get more expensive from there. You could possibly also get an axolotl from a rehoming or a rescue situation. It's usually easy to find someone who's looking to rehome their axolotl on places like Craigslist or Kijiji. And by acquiring your axolotl this way, you may end up with some free supplies as well, although you may not get the healthiest axolotl. Whenever you get any new animal, axolotls included, you should always quarantine them for a short period of time to monitor their health before you put them into their permanent enclosure. With aquatics, that is doubly important because disease can spread very easily in water. Generally, it's recommended to quarantine your axolotl for a minimum of two weeks before putting them into their display tank. If you notice during that time that the axolotl has a health issue, you can medicate or treat as needed without needing to expose their illness or medications to the display tank. This is obviously important when introducing a new axolotl to a tank that already has an axolotl in it, but it's also important when you get your first axolotl. If you only have one axolotl, it's okay to use the display tank for quarantine, but you might not want to have any substrate or any plants in the tank during that time because you'll want to monitor the axolotl's droppings and such. Also, some medications that you might have to use during that quarantine period might kill your plants. You can always add substrate and plants later. But the best option for a quarantine tank for an axolotl is going to be a tub. You will need to do frequent water changes if you use a tub, probably daily, just to keep the ammonia levels down because the tub wouldn't be cycled. You should see good health for two weeks before you move your axolotl 
into their permanent display tank, which means if you have them in the quarantine for a week and then you notice that they're sick, that doesn't mean treat them for the sickness and then move them into the display tank at the two week mark of owning them. It means to treat them for the sickness, wait until they're better, and then move them into the display tank after they have been better for two weeks. Like any other animal, axolotls can and sometimes do get sick. If you get a really healthy axolotl from a good breeder and you take great care of them and you do everything right, the chance of them getting sick or injured is low, but it is still possible. This is why having a quarantine setup is important, whether you have a brand new axolotl or you've had your axolotl for a while and they are getting sick. Having a quarantine bin is strongly recommended. You should also make sure your axolotl will be able to receive veterinary care if needed. If there are no veterinarians in your area that can treat amphibians, it might not be a good idea for you to get an axolotl. In my case, I had to call several veterinarians in my area before I was referred to one who treats exotics. This veterinarian is a 45 minute drive away from my house, but in the event I should need a vet for my axolotl, I know how to reach one. Some common signs to look out for that may indicate your axolotl is sick are if they're poorly responsive, if they have gill degradation, tail curling, anemia, floating, lack of appetite, skin lesions, and eye lesions. Some of the more common ailments are new tank syndrome, which occurs when a tank's beneficial bacteria colony isn't well enough established to process the axolotl's waste. This usually is due to not cycling the tank or not cycling it properly or for long enough before you introduce the axolotl. Treatment would involve a combination of multiple water changes, possibly daily or multiple times a day, adding nitrifying bacteria, and addressing the underlying cause. There's also old tank syndrome, which usually occurs from high levels of nitrate or ammonia due to poor husbandry. Prolonged exposure to high levels of nitrate or ammonia can lead to ammonia burns, degradation of the axolotl's gills, and skin lesions. Treatment would, again, involve multiple water changes and addressing the underlying causes. Hyperthermia, which is the opposite of hypothermia, meaning the water is too hot. Axolotls are a cool water species, and when the water is consistently too hot for them, reaching temperatures above 70 degrees Fahrenheit, they may show signs ranging from a lack of appetite to uncontrollable floating. Treatment usually involves dropping the water temperature below their ideal range to rapidly cool the axolotl and then bringing it back to the correct range. Some people even recommend temporarily putting the axolotl in the refrigerator. However, that is a highly controversial practice and should only be done under the advisement of a veterinarian. Antibiotic treatment may be advised to prevent secondary infection and you might have to install an aquarium chiller as a long-term solution. Impaction, also referred to as gastric foreign body, can occur when an axolotl swallows something they can't digest or pass, such as gravel or rocks. I mentioned this earlier when I talked about substrate. As I said, this can cause digestive blockages and constipation. If axolotls are underfed, they may also eat their substrate, which can cause impaction. Sometimes the axolotl may regurgitate the gravel, but in some cases, manual removal might be necessary. If your axolotl is impacted and they're not regurgitating the gravel, consult a veterinarian for manual removal because anesthetic might be required. Bacterial infections can be somewhat common and symptoms may include loss of appetite. In advanced cases of bacterial infection, 
euthanasia might be necessary, but in the early stages, antibiotics or dips in methylene blue can help reverse this infection. Lower water temperatures may help as well, but stress will worsen the bacterial infection or stress may weaken the immune system in the first place, which will lead to a bacterial infection. Parasites can be somewhat common, especially when axolotls are fed live fish. This may also occur if water change equipment is shared between multiple aquariums and a parasite is present in another tank. Treatment for external parasites may include baths in methylene blue or formalin, whereas internal parasites are much harder to get rid of and you should consult a veterinarian. Trauma can be a somewhat common ailment as axolotls are delicate. Sometimes axolotls fight, especially during mating season, and sometimes they fight over space. Injuries should be treated immediately to prevent secondary infection. If limbs are amputated, the wound should be left to heal naturally. Do not cauterize the wound because that will prevent regrowth. Separating your axolotls may be recommended. If your axolotl is injured from an item in the tank, you should remove that item. If your axolotl has white cotton-like tufts on its skin, that is called saprolegnia and it should be treated by a veterinarian. This may be caused by poor water quality or possibly aggression between axolotls. And some aquarium products that are safe for fish may not be safe for axolotls and might cause toxicosis. Products you should avoid include malachite green, copper-based treatments, and tetracycline. Excessive treatment with salt can also cause damage. Axolotls are naturally curious animals and they will watch you from their tank. If you keep a single axolotl, you will be their primary source of entertainment and they will happily greet you and beg for food when you approach the tank. Sometimes they will stare at you from their tank, watching your every move. If you house multiple axolotls together, they'll spend less time watching you and more time watching each other. Sometimes they'll be together and sometimes they'll want their space from each other. They may flick their gills more often. Axolotls communicate by use of visual cues and during mating, they use chemical cues as well. It is true that axolotls spend most of their time at the bottom of the tank, but they do occasionally swim and sometimes they even float. Excessive floating may be a sign of illness, but just because your axolotl happens to be floating doesn't necessarily mean they're sick. They also occasionally like to lay on top of plants, both real plants and fake plants. So if you have live plants, make sure that the plants won't die from having an axolotl lay on top of it. Axolotls are also known to sometimes appear to play in the bubbles produced by an air stone or a bubble wall. Since axolotls are light sensitive, they may spend a lot of time in their cave or under plant leaves or in otherwise shady areas during the day or when the tank light is on. When eating large worms, it is common for axolotls to spit the worm out and then suck it back in several times. They don't exactly have teeth and this is how they chew their food, for lack of better description. If you notice your axolotl's tail is curling, that can often be a sign that they're unhappy or stressed. Check your water parameters, check the temperature, check the environment. Is there too much light? Is there too much or too little open space? Do they have a place to go and hide? Is the axolotl injured? Does anything look off or out of place? Full disclosure, I am not an axolotl breeder, just an axolotl keeper. I've been keeping axolotls for nearly four years, but I have never bred axolotls myself. Therefore, I will not be doing a full how-to guide on breeding axolotls. Instead, I'm only going to cover some of the basics, 
and suggest some resources where you can learn more if you are interested in breeding axolotls. First, breeding is not for the casual or inexperienced axolotl keeper, and it's a lot more complicated than putting two axolotls together and feeding them a bucket of tropical fish. You will need multiple tanks as well as bins if you plan on breeding axolotls. You'll also need a plan for the babies. As I said before, you should not keep males and females together long term because the male will overbreed with the female, which will cause her body to be overly stressed. Instead, you should only put them together long enough for them to breed, and then you should separate them. You will need a permanent tank for your male and a permanent tank for your female, and you will also need a separate breeding tank as well as bins for the babies to grow and develop in. Your permanent tanks for your adult males and females can be normal display tanks that we talked about earlier in this video, but the breeding tank will need to be different. It will need to be pretty barren in comparison. You will need aquarium decor, but it will need to be something that you can easily remove eggs from, such as PVC pipes and airline tubing. There should be no substrate, and the only filter should be a sponge filter with the airflow turned really, really low and the tank should be distinctly colder than normal display tanks. You can induce breeding by dropping the temperature of the female's tank or by introducing her to the colder breeding tank. This change in temperature should cause her to become gravid. Once she is gravid, introduce the male. They do the deed, and once the deed is done, you can remove the male and put him back in his display tank leave the female in the breeding tank while she lays her eggs and then remove her when she's finished. Egg laying can take between 12 and 72 hours and she will lay hundreds of eggs, sometimes upwards of 1,500. The eggs will be stuck to the aquarium decor. You're going to move the eggs into tubs to monitor their development. When they start hatching, you will need to do multiple water changes every day. Newly hatched axolotls will not feed immediately. First, they will need to absorb their yolk sac. Within 48 hours though, they will require tiny live food items in large quantities. Baby brine shrimp, live daphnia, microworms are the most appropriate first foods. As the babies grow, they will accept larger food items. Keep them well fed and you can avoid cannibalism and nipping. They will develop limbs starting with the front legs and then the back legs. When the babies have all four legs and are eating well and are around two and a half to three inches long, it's time to start looking for homes. As I mentioned before, do not breed your female axolotls more than once per year. Just make sure that your breeding axolotls are well fed before, during, and after the breeding process, especially the females. As mentioned at the beginning of this video, axolotls are 100% aquatic and they do not typically metamorphosize into terrestrial salamanders, but on rare occasion, it does happen. This should never be done intentionally though, as it can greatly reduce the axolotl's lifespan and quality of life, but when it does happen, the axolotl should be treated basically as a tiger salamander that has undergone metamorphosis although they are different and slight differences have been observed. Currently, there is no consensus on what exactly will cause an axolotl to metamorphosize, but documented cases have been attributed to such factors as poor water quality, poor husbandry, lack of food, and even improper labeling, meaning the person was actually sold a tiger salamander larva when they were told that it was an axolotl. There are also documented cases of metamorphosis being intentionally induced with iodine, but those cases almost always end with the axolotl dying shortly after the metamorphosis, so I will not be telling you how to do that. When an axolotl is going through metamorphosis, they will exhibit distinct physical changes. 
They will develop eyelids and will become able to blink or close their eyes. They will absorb their external gills and develop internal lungs. Their legs will become more muscular to support their body weight. Their tail fin will be absorbed into the body and their tails will become more round. Their body shape will change, their head will become more rounded, and their skin will become thicker and more firm and will change color. Once metamorphosis begins, the process cannot be reversed or stopped. Fully metamorphosized axolotls will become completely terrestrial, and their husbandry will be similar to that of a terrestrial tiger salamander. They will need a high humidity environment with a deep layer of a humidity retaining substrate such as cocoa fiber or organic topsoil mixed with sphagnum moss that the axolotl can burrow into. You will need a large water bowl as well that the axolotl can get in and out of easily. Their enclosure should be plastic or glass with the floor space of at least a 20 gallon long enclosure. Their diet will also change as they will now feed not just on earthworms, but also crickets, waxworms, flies, beetles, mealworms, and other such feeders. But it is common for metamorphosized axolotls to lose interest in food altogether. Sadly, most metamorphosized axolotls do not live more than a year after they metamorphosize, whether that metamorphosis was induced intentionally or accidentally. Well, that's all I have for this video. I know that this video was long and I appreciate you sticking around and watching. If you like this video, please make sure that you leave a like and that you subscribe to my channel for more content like this. I have also left links in the description for additional resources on axolotl care, including additional videos that I've made, care guides from resources that I trust, and a list of good axolotl breeders that I recommend if you're looking to add an axolotl to your life. If you want to see more from me, you can follow me on TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram, and I also stream on Twitch. Please remember to take care of yourself and to take care of your pets, and as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.